What's up, everybody? Um, uh, this is going to be a driving video this time. Uh, I'm going to do a Q&A for you guys. Uh, it's one courtesy of a lot of good questions from Mohammed. Uh, you guys, some of you guys might have uh, might recognize his name. Uh, I mentioned him in my last video, uh, my pick, uh, my uh, drop and hook in Fort Worth, and uh, he had a number of good trucking related questions that are. Gonna be more uh, tailored toward those of you guys who are newer to the trucking industry, or going to become truckers, or if you're outsider to the trucking industry. If, if you're an experienced driver, uh, a lot of the uh, pretty much this is just gonna be yeah, I agree with this or I agree with that, but uh, or you might have your own way of doing things that might differ a little bit from what I what I'm gonna say here in this one. Um, doesn't necessarily mean I'm right or you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong or whatever and sometimes it's just hey this is the way I'm trained and this is the way uh, my mentality is on it or something along that line but I'm always receptive to other inputs too like if there's a different way of doing things sell me on it I mean, if you're an experienced driver and you listen to this info and you have a different perspective or some kind of input that uh that you think is worth uh, that uh, me considering? Uh, yeah, throw it out there, and I'll uh, I'll definitely consider it. Cause, like I say I I know people might think I'm a know-it-all at times, but I I'm very receptive to learning uh, all the time. Yeah, it doesn't matter where it's coming from either. Uh, it could be someone with 30 years of experience or someone with uh, 30 months. Uh, Anyway, uh, I'm sitting at Russell's Travel Center in uh, New Mexico, uh, just outside the Texas line on I-40. Um, I still got this load, this Art Dog Glass load, going to Fairfield, California. Uh, I've not gotten any messages asking about swapping off of it or dropping it yet. It's it's today's Thanksgiving now. Uh, speaking of, happy Thanksgiving to all of you guys. Uh, hope you guys all have an enjoyable time with it. Um, uh, the the diner here at Russell's actually had a Thanksgiving, yeah, like a whole turkey dinner thing going on, but uh, uh, I was tempted to eat it, but I'm not a heavy eater. Um, like I, I would probably have a nightmare of a time with uh, um, uh, indigestion or acid reflux or whatever else if I ate all of what they have to offer there. It's, I mean, I was so tempted to eat it though. Uh, I did end up having the pumpkin pie after I got to eat my food. Uh, I ended up doing the just the the tamale, the tamale plate. Yeah, it was not bad. Uh, kind of weird eating tamales with uh, like a sauce on it, but uh, it was yeah, it was good. Service was great. Uh, I tipped the guy extra because uh, yeah, it was an excellent server. Um, so all things, uh, all in all, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I like coming here. The diner here is good. It always gets good ratings from other truckers, and I like the little market, the little market thing, whatever. Uh, there's, yeah, they have a, you know, it's not like a huge, like a grocery store kind of place, but yeah, they do, they usually always have a good number of items here that I can't find at other, yeah, at just any run of the mill truck stop. So. This is always one of my favorites when I want to get you know, more supplies on. Uh, doesn't matter if it's like food or drinks or uh, uh, snacks or I don't know utensils or paper plates or who knows whatever else. Anyway, uh, enough about what's going on with me. Let's get to Muhammad's uh, email because yeah, he had a lot of info. He did ask it in the group. I mean, not in the group, um, on one of my YouTube videos. Um, yeah, I basically just, um, so I, yeah, he gave me his email address so we could correspond by email. And uh, and I hope I'm not, um, uh, I don't know, man, embarrassing Muhammad or putting him on the spot or anything like that. Uh, please, uh, Muhammad, you had some great, great questions here that are all good for... Uh, Good for answering for a general population that watches my channel. So uh, I thank you for uh, asking that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about your email. Uh, kind of read out the email to everybody. And then I'll go step by step with your questions and answer each of them for you. Okay. Uh, like I said, I thought about answering this by uh, you know, just a direct answer to your email request. But I'm like, you know what? This is probably much better if I just do a video. Um uh, 
because it's yeah, like I say, it's it's right along, uh, right in line with uh, what I like my channel to focus on, which is being useful information for other truckers. Uh, whether it just be a, hey, this is what this customer is like, or maybe helping out or uh, giving perspective that someone else, another trucker, could learn from or something. Um, not to mention my, yeah, you know, my kids get to watch what uh, what daddy's up to and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that's always a plus, too. All right, so let's go to the email. Um, so Muhammad writes, thanks for taking the time to answer my request. Please allow me to give you a small intro so you know a general idea about me. I did get my CDL Class A two years ago, and since I was using car for short commutes to work or shopping, I decided to drive for a living using my car. And I was driving a gig economy job full-time with Amazon Flex. Now I feel more confident that I can be a good truck driver. I was watching your YouTube videos even before I get my license. I learned a lot from the driving tips and compilations. I consider you among the smartest and safest professional drivers and virtual trainers in YouTube. Here are my questions. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go on to the questions next. We'll get, let's cover the intro part there first, all right? So, um, uh, now, I mentioned in my last video, Muhammad and I have had interactions in the past. Um, usually, it's like, I think it was usually on backing videos that I've done or whatever. Uh, trying to remember if I've seen you on my live streams, Muhammad, or, uh, or not. Uh, I know you and I have interacted, and I know for a fact that um, backing videos, and I think there was even that one... Uh, where I, uh, I think I was, it was about maneuvering in truck stops where I was at the Flying J in Kingman uh, probably a couple of years back. Uh, I, I want to say you were, uh, you and I interacted on that video. I could be wrong, but. So yeah, Muhammad, he, he's been, uh, for everybody here, Muhammad has been following my channel for quite a while. And like I said, we've had multiple in, uh, interactions. So um, yeah, so let's get to uh, some of that here. Um, let's go, all right, so yeah, Class A, you've been doing uh, Amazon Flex though, and now you're ready to jump into actual Class A vehicles, or uh, truck, tractor and trailers. Okay, so first of your questions is, uh, what's the best way to do braking in a semi, and how to do stab braking? I read about it in a manual, I don't know how it is done. Okay, so, that's a good question, I'm going to have to uh, split this a little bit in uh, a couple of different parts here because stab braking specifically um, depending on who's listening uh, you're gonna get some confusion so I want to make sure though everybody who's listening is completely clear on what context is being used for that because if you talk to an old-school trucker and you hear the word stab braking that, that's an emergency braking technique that uh, yeah that they're going to think of they're not going to associate it with what CDL schools today uh, teach all of us, which is stab braking is just a form of speed control on uh, when you're going down uh, steep grades with a truck. I think you're meaning the latter portion, uh, latter part of that, which is how do you keep your speed under control using the stab braking technique you know, going down steep grades. And, but I just, you know, I just want to make sure it's known though, because some of you guys are longer, longer time drivers uh, in the industry, and you're going to get confused by this if I start answering it with the context that it's going down a hill and controlling speed. I'm like, no, that's not stab braking. Stab braking is when you freaking slam on the brake like an emergency brake kind of thing. Okay, so we all know how to do that part. Um, that's not what Muhammad means by that. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, I went to CDL school myself uh, five and a half years ago, and they specifically referred to it as stab braking technique for going down uh, hills, uh, controlling my speed. And I'm pretty certain that's what Muhammad is asking us in terms of too. All right, so that considered going down hills, there are two basic forms of, uh, of speed control outside of using your compression brakes or Jake brakes or you know, anything or you know Jacobson brakes whatever term you want to use uh, for them I'll just gener generically call them compression brakes 
um, outside of your compression brakes doing their job on, uh, completely on their own, uh, which I'll get to more on that as well, because I think he did have a question. Um, no, okay, I'll, I'll cover that. I was kind of looking on, kind of skimming through his other questions, and I didn't see anything on there about downhill stuff. So, all right, but for downhill specifically, you got two basic forms of using the service brakes, which is the one your pedal operates. Um, one is the stab brake technique and the other is the snub brake technique. Alright, so your question is specifically about stab braking, so I'm going to go ahead and cover the stab brake technique first. So generally when you're doing a stab brake, what you do is uh, you're usually going to stay within about a 5 mile an hour window. Doesn't matter, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the speed is, it depends on what percent grade you're on, how heavy your load is. Uh, how quickly you're picking up speed or whatever, or how long, how often you're hitting your brakes. Uh, all these things should be things that would be considered on that. Uh, you don't want to overheat your brakes. So this is why I recommend uh, be very limited on how much you use this. Uh, one of the things I was taught by my trainer, now mind you, my trainer had 19 and a half years of experience when he trained me. So he's a very experienced driver. Um, one of the things he taught me though was if if you have to use your brakes more than I think it was three times in one minute, it's time to go down to a, a lower gear. Because if you keep using them more than that, you're gonna get much higher risk of uh, overheating your brakes and losing them. Um, and for that reason, when you're going down grades, if you're gonna use those service brakes at all, um, be looking out both your left and right side mirrors. It doesn't matter if you're. Uh, yeah, if you're in the right lane and there's no traffic over there, use that right side mirror. You can be checking for smoking brakes, whether it's coming from your tractor or your trailer. And I'm going to tell you another uh, an anecdote on that one in a little bit here. All right, so um, now stab braking, though, generally how it's done is stay within a five mile an hour window. Let's just say uh, maybe I want to do somewhere between 55 and 60 miles an hour going down a hill. Um, and then mainly because I'm already in a gear that's just going to limit me to that speed without having an upshift to a higher gear, which, uh, which will make the compression brakes even less effective. Compression brakes work uh, the best uh, the lower the gear you go and generally the higher the RPM is. So if you're only down to like 1,000, uh, 1,100 RPMs, in one gear, it's not the compression brakes are not going to work as effectively at that engine speed as they will, let's just say, at uh, like 1500, 1600, or whatever. Um, so, that's another thing there. It's you know, it's just like with the acceleration, uh, you can accelerate a lot more quickly in the low gears, and then the higher the gear is, the harder it is to pick up speed. The compression brakes work the exact same way. They can't do their job that effectively the higher the gear is you're in. So if, you, if your compression brakes alone cannot get the job done and you want to avoid using your service brakes as much as possible, it's time to slow down. Slow down and get to, figure out what RPM your engine needs to be down to or less to, that'll, that'll allow you to get into the next lower gear. Uh, for most of the auto shift trucks, all of the auto shift trucks that I've ever driven, uh, Two or three different ones with Sea of England, and um, I've had a few loaner trucks here at JCT that were all auto shift, but and all of them were pretty much the same way. Um, going down a hill, anywhere between 1,700 and 2,200 RPM seemed to be what the truck itself wanted to do. If I was in automatic mode, so um, if I wanted to get down to a lower gear. If I'm above 1700 RPM, I need to get down below 1700 and then the truck can go ahead and grab the next lower gear. And then I can check from there, all right, how well are my compression brakes going to work from there. Uh, if they do work, uh, fine, then I won't need to touch my service brakes the rest of the way down the hill. If they're, not do, if they're still not doing a good enough job, then all right, I still got a stab brake or snub brake, but I won't necessarily have to use them as, um, as much. Um, I won't have to use as much pressure as frequently either. Um, so now going back to the stab brake thing though, when you do actually use the stab brake technique, 
take off about five miles an hour from whatever your, your speed is. So go to the top of your range, the bottom of your five mile an hour range that you're working with. Like I said, 55 to 60, just as an example here. Um, so if you're doing, if you get up to 60, stab brake down to 55, and then make sure you, uh, it takes at least three seconds to get from 60 down to 55. Don't just like, boom, like instantly down to, yeah, from 60 to 55. Let it gradually slow down to 55. So you're not putting too much brake pressure in. The more uh, uh, effort you put in, the more pressure you put on the pads, then the more pressure you put on, the more heat you're creating. Um, and also the faster the truck is moving, the faster you'll, you'll generate heat as well. So that's something also to consider. All right, so uh, I think online you'll see like a 532 or something like that rule. Five miles an hour, take at least three seconds to lose that five, and don't use the brakes more than a couple of times per minute, if I remember correctly what the, uh, what the rule of thumb is on that. Like I said, I was taught three, uh, I think, I have to double check with my trainer. It's been so long. I I hardly ever use that. I mean, I, I do stab brake actually uh, a fair amount in this truck because I only have 10, yeah, 10 gears. And the way my truck is geared, I tend to be a little on the impatient side with uh, not wanting to go down the hill at the speed that I really should go down if, in order to avoid using my brakes at all. Uh, it just depends. Depends on heavy, how heavy the load is, uh, where exactly I'm at, and what, what kind of percent grade I'm dealing with, that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Um, but with an auto shift truck, I seldom ever even touch the service brakes one time. Um, even in this truck, a lot of times I don't touch the service brakes at all going down the hill. I'll get into the correct gear that I want and just let it, uh, let it go. And uh, yeah, to stay within the RPM range that I'm looking for, which usually in this truck is going to be around, say, I don't know, 18, 1900 RPM, and that kind of waver in between those two ranges. Now, auto shift trucks with uh, descent control mode, though, they'll do a much better job. They'll just they'll stick you like glue to whatever speed you want to be going down that hill at, um, if you're in the correct gear. So. This is one of the things I do love about auto shift trucks. Uh, I, I hate driving auto shift in general, but if I could have that feature in my truck, oh yeah, I would definitely, uh, I would love to have that. Uh, but I'm not willing to go to auto shift just for that feature, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, all right, so that's, that covers the stab braking technique. Now let's talk about um, snub braking. Okay, snub braking is, uh, it's, different it's more of a constant use the brakes just enough to keep the speed at a certain amount going all the way down the hill now there was a point in time when the trucking industry where compression brakes didn't exist or as you might know jake brakes so uh, when that was the case truckers the only way they had to control their speed going down hills was to use service brakes whether it be the stab brake technique or snub brake technique and snub brake you just go constantly uh, all the way down the bottom of the, uh, to the bottom of the hill riding your brakes all the way down but now mind you like i said earlier the faster you're going the faster you're going to build up heat so if you're going to use the snub brake technique at all you need to go a lot slower down that hill than what you would normally do if you had service brake i mean if you had compression brakes to work with so, um, and, and I, I haven't been driving that long, but I, yeah, I get enough uh, nuggets of knowledge from a lot more um, experienced drivers or, you know, drivers who've been in this industry a hell of a lot longer, or maybe even retired, or whatever, how things were done back in the day. And yeah, like you kind of use the go down a snowy, um, snowy grade kind of rule, go slow. And then just use a steady amount of pressure just to keep your speed constant all the way down. And they, you know, truckers back then, they would make it down to the bottom of the hill without burning up their brakes at all. Yeah, how'd they do it? Yeah, because they kept their speed down. You might normally think you want to, uh, yeah, you want a snub brake doing 50 miles an hour or even 60 miles an hour down that hill. Uh, it's going to build up a lot more heat than snub braking going down at uh, that same hill at say uh, 25 30 miles an hour so so i say if you have to use that technique uh, get your speed down a lot 
yeah, put those four ways on and uh, just accept that you're not going to go down that hill with the same speed as everybody else. In fact, speaking of that, regardless, it doesn't matter if you use the compression brakes, stab brake, snub brake, whatever technique, going down steep grades, I recommend do not go by what other truckers are doing. You don't know how much weight they have in their trailer. Uh, you don't know what kind of engine they have. You don't know what kind of transmission they have. How many gears do they have? How are those gears actually, uh, yeah, what are the gear ratios of those gears? Uh, what's their final drive ratio? Their, you know, their, uh, the, rear, uh, the rear diff, basically. Uh, all that uh, factors into how, uh, how your, your, your specific truck is going to handle any particular grade with any particular load. Um, now, I do have kind of a good rule of thumb that will help you out here. You didn't ask for it, but I'm going to give it anyway. Um, generally, uh, let's say if you're going down a 6% grade, which is typically the steepest you're going to see in, uh, on the interstate highways. That's actually the interstate construction standard limit. There are a couple of uh, spots on interstates that are 7%, but the interstate construction standard calls for no more than 6% grades on, uh, on steep hills. Um, certain areas, though, like Eisenhower Tunnel area, both sides of it, you're going to have some 7s, and uh, there are a few other little spots that are exceptions to the rule, not the normal, uh, not the standard. So keep this in mind, okay? So if you're going down to 6% grade, and let's say you have a 40,000 pound load, that's a heavy load. And yeah, for me, the, the best way to go down that, you know, like with my 10 speed truck would be to probably use sixth or maybe seventh gear at most. Uh, definitely not eighth. Uh, if I have that heavy load and a 6% grade, there's no way my, my compression brakes are gonna get the job done in eighth gear. Seventh, I think I'll still pick up speed, and what I'll tend to do is, uh, if the, if I know the downhill grade's not super long, yeah, you know, like maybe it's in spurts like Donner Pass, which I don't know why everyone's afraid of Donner Pass. Um, Donner Pass is not that bad. It's a long, it's a long trip from top to bottom, but it's a lot of down and then back up, down and back up. Then the downhills are never more than uh, maybe a couple miles, if that, before you're flattening back out and where you can kind of cool off a little bit um, so I, I think Donner is easy compared to uh, a lot of people come to the trucking industry hearing all these horror stories about Donner Pass and uh, yeah, all the death and destruction that happens on that highway from trucks losing brakes and stuff don't no I don't you don't need to be that worried about Donner Pass uh, yeah I mean, be worried about idiots going down Donner Pass with you doing stuff like that uh, but if you do what you're supposed to do, um, you know, and your and your fun, and your equipment is all functioning correctly, and you don't have anything to really worry about there. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, Donner Pass, a couple mile downhill, and then if I, if I I might try to just to try to keep my speed up a little bit, maybe use I think it's seventh gear, or uh, no eighth gear. Yeah, eighth gear I can be. Uh, I think I can get up to uh, somewhere in that 55 to 60 range before I absolutely have to shift in the ninth. Um, so uh, if I want to stay in eighth gear and not have to drop down into seventh, where I'd end up being down at like 40 miles an hour or less, uh, what I'll tend to do is just drop down to a lower speed in eighth gear. Yeah, because like if it's just gonna if it's gonna pick up speed, but yeah, you know, pick it up a little bit more gradually, where I can get all the way down to the bottom of the hill and not have to use my my uh, service brakes at all before I, by the time I flatten out, I'm okay with doing that. Yeah, that's uh, I'll definitely do that if I can get away with it. But if I'm gonna keep picking up speed a little too quickly and I know I'm gonna have to use the service brakes too frequently, it's time to slow down, whether I like it or not. I'm not going to take a risk of burning up my brakes or having to use a runaway truck ramp or killing somebody else or myself. Um, um, so there is that. Don't worry about what other truckers are doing. They could be empty, and you could be pulling, a, uh, getting pushed by a very heavy load. Or it could be the other way around. You could be empty, and they could be heavy. You know, but more often than not, you're going to be tempted to want to go the same speed as everybody else. If you're on a heavy load and you're only doing 40 miles an hour, 
you might be tempted. All right, I want to do 60 plus like everybody else is. <clears throat> do it at your own peril. Uh, do it at your own and everybody else's peril around you because that's what risk you're going to take. Worry about your load. Don't worry about other people's loads. Don't worry about how their trucks are set up compared to what yours are. They could be different. Now, uh, like this uh, reliable uh, carriers uh, movering company guy there with that sweet sleeper set up there. He's yeah. You know, for all I know, he's probably got an 18 speed in that thing. Now uh, he's geared. He's geared differently than me. Even if he had the same engine, he's geared differently. So he might handle. The exact same kind of uh, gross weight a different way than I would um, and, you know, and be at a different speed. Okay, so I think that cover, I've gone pretty well in depth on that question there with stab and uh, snub breaking. Um, so I hope that answers your question adequately there, Muhammad. That was a, a good question, by the way. It's as are everything here. Okay, how to avoid getting into accidents. What's the daily habits that help you avoid trouble from four-wheelers? Okay, so I didn't start driving in, in a truck until I was already retired from the Air Force. And by then, I was already 41, 42. Uh, I'm trying to remember. 41, I think. Yeah, I think I was 41. I enlisted when I was 21, and I retired from the Air Force in July of 2015. Got my CDL in March of 2016, and so uh, I, I did have all those years of driving experience to deal with. And I, I yeah, I had my fair share of being an idiot four-wheeler driver and crazy and you know driving like a moron. Uh, but then I started, yeah, you know, I just. Some of the other things I realize, like the less interactions I need to have with other traffic, the better it's going to be. The less stressful it is. The less I find myself getting pissed off at idiots on the road or whatever. So, and I kind of started realizing I don't have to be in a big hurry. I can just kick back. Even when I was in my car commuting from Victorville to the base uh, before I got my CDL, there were a lot of times I would just kick back in the right lane and do about similar speed to what the trucks were doing. The less times I had to move out of that right lane to the other lane, the the happier I, I found myself being. It was that I was more laid back, relaxed, not stressed out at all. Um, and my fuel economy got even better too, a lot better. So that was another plus to that. Um, but then all it takes is just one freaking moron out there in my yeah, in my space to get me driving like an asshole at least for a bit. And then I would, you know, I'll start driving faster and more aggressively, whatever, just to get the hell away from them or something. Uh, in a truck, though, you can't do that a lot of times. A lot of us are driving governed trucks, so, yeah, and a lot of us are going to drive at our governed speeds, uh, which I do a lot. Uh, I do 70 miles an hour, and um, something you're going to have to learn to uh, to work with don't try to force your way around trucks that are just barely slower than you. If you can't, if general rule is, if you can't get around them within about a mile or two, uh, just stay behind them. My general rule is, if I'm doing 70 miles an hour, if I catch up to a slightly, just slightly slower truck, I'll back, I'll back off to about 68, and then I'll evaluate. If their speed stays consistent with mine, then I'll look at what's going on behind me in the mirrors, and if if it looks wide open, uh, like no traffic to deal with, I'm not going to get in anybody's way. And there's no terrain that's going to possibly uh, prevent me from getting adequately around them in a timely manner. I'll go ahead and bump back up to 70 and kind of work my way past them. It won't take incredibly long at two mile an hour difference, but it's not going to be quick either. Um, if they start, if I'm doing 68 and they start to pull away from me at all, yeah, even just the least bit, then I'll stay at 68. I don't, I don't need to do 70. It's not going to make a big difference to me. It's if you think two miles an hour difference over a, a five minute period or something is going to really make or break your day. You got problems. Uh, you ser you have serious problems with uh, your tri your shift management, ma uh, you know, trip management, uh, all that. You don't need to worry about that. Not to mention, uh, you know. That little bit of space, uh, it, you know, five minutes. Uh, what it might take, it might take you and uh, make a difference of about ten seconds or so over a five-minute period uh, in terms of uh, how long it takes you to cover that distance. 
Um, hardly anything. Um, so anyway, that's one of the tricks of the trade. Don't have interactions with other traffic of any kind more than you absolutely have to, if possible. Ideally, uh, you see one person out here, you want to have one interaction with them and one interaction only, if, if none at all. The more you have to keep going back and forth with them, the more you're going to yeah, you know, you're gonna create a risky, uh, more hazardous situation there. All it takes is one of you guys to blow a steer tire while you're right next to the other, and next thing you know, both of you are uh, running off the road because you could end up running into them, or they could run into you or something. So, you know, they say they leave space. A lot of people have no clue just how much space you really need to leave in a truck. And then look out ahead, uh, be very predictive and aware of uh, what's going on there. Anticipate things. Um, I had uh, I have a video from when I was still at Sierra England, my, my first year of trucking there, somewhere around there. I would, and it's here on my YouTube. You can watch it. Um, I had an encounter with a deer on Interstate 80 in the Des Moines area. Uh, I was eastbound on 80, just east of Des Moines, and I remembered, it was like 2.30 in the morning, if I remember, so it was in the middle of the night, had not, I mean, I, but I was paying attention, just out of the corner of my eye, I caught something over here on the right, you know, in the field off to the right side, and it, it looked like it could have been a deer, like a deer's head, and it looked like it was going that way at a pretty good speed. So I'm like, well, okay, I can triangulate very easily where I think that's going to end up. Even though I couldn't actually see it. I just saw a little silhouette briefly, just for one little, like a half a second. And then sure enough, and then meanwhile, I'm getting passed by this little, uh, I think a white pickup, if I remember correctly. And he gets not very far ahead of me, and I'm time, timing stuff out, like, where's this pickup? Where, I, where I, am I guessing at where this deer is going to encounter the road? And, uh, yeah, I thought there was going to be, uh, this deer was not going to survive. It was going to run into the road. It was either going to uh, run out into the path of the pickup and get ran over by the pickup, or it was going to get into my lane Realized it was about to get run over by the pickup, just stop and turn around and then have no time to, to avoid getting ran over by me. So, uh, those those were all going on in my head uh, instantly before it even happened. Before I could even uh, definitively see that the deer was actually coming into the road. I knew I saw something there, but I just couldn't see much. And, yeah, sure enough, as soon as I saw it hitting the asphalt, and I saw where it was at, and I'm like, oh shit. I backed off quickly because one of the things I realized is how is that pickup driver going to react to it? Are they going to swerve into my lane to avoid hitting that deer if they if they even see it? I don't even think the guy saw it because he was a little bit up ahead of me, and they kind of had this like, what the hell I just hit kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, you, my dash cam, if you really want to watch it, uh, you'll see that the deer goes... Uh, yeah, it looked like it tried to stop in mid-path, like right in the middle of a full-on sprint right in front of the guy's pickup and got ran right over by his right side tires and uh, ends up like spinning around, sliding and, a spin, you know, sliding and spinning down the lane. And uh, something came out from, uh, I want to say it was part of the pickup, but there are questions about whether it was one of the deer's legs or something. I don't know, but I think it was part of the pickup. You can see the, the whatever it was going sliding behind the truck as well, and uh, then I go passing by, and you could hear me hitting my brakes to avoid hitting it, uh, hitting uh, being involved in that. So, um, anticipate, be aware of things going on. Uh, there's also uh, I don't know, you might be able to watch my history on here. Uh, there is a video I just responded, I uh, just got involved with on uh, I think it's Dashcam Lessons um, YouTube channel. Sometimes he does use some of my content on his videos. Uh, I always give him permission to, uh, to use my content as long as he, uh, uh, as long as he gives me uh, credit for the, the content. It's all good. Um, but all right, so one of his videos that he just had recently this week, um, I put a com few comments in there, and there was one where a woman in the in the dash cam vehicle was getting onto the freeway. 
and trying to merge into the the right lane because her lane was basically a merge only lane where uh, where actually it was it was turned into an exit only lane for the next off ramp. Um, there was a white SUV that was already in the right lane was coming up to try to catch uh, well coming up because they were at their normal speed and then they were deciding they they needed to get off at the next exit. So I saw them hitting the brakes, and then it looked like they tried to move over into the, the small gap between the dash camera and the person in front of her. And I guess she didn't like it. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, that SUV just slowed down for, for a good reason. Why? You know, it, it's, people always have a reason for doing something. If you can't figure out what the reason is, you should be figuring out why Why does this person do that? Is there some inane reason or do they have a, a good basis for that? Um, so it ended up the, this, uh, this SUV driver realized they couldn't get into that gap there because the dash camera got too close to the, the car in front of her. And they didn't want to cut her off, so they ended up uh, speeding up. And then they got a safe distance in front of the car that was in front of her. But then she, by, and meanwhile, she had gotten behind the, the SUV and moved back over and I think was trying to accelerate again to try to pass the SUV on the right when, like, well, did you not realize what the SUV driver was doing in the first place? They looked like they were trying to come over so they can plan on getting off the freeway. To me, I'd be like, okay, I'm expecting them to want to do that. Give them room. Give them space, let them get over, and wait, and then maybe get in front of them, uh, wait till uh, they're over, and then pass them on the left like I'm supposed to do, or drop in behind them, or whatever. Or, you know, if someone's getting ready to get off the freeway, I'm expecting they're going to probably slow down before they get to the off ramp as well. So um, I would rather just stay in another lane and wait for them to get off the freeway. Uh, good example of that here is also uh, signal early. When I came right here into this spot yesterday, earlier this morning, and I was coming in from uh, Texas, um, I hit my turn signal uh, probably a good, at least a quarter of a mile, probably at least a good quarter of a mile before I actually hit the off ramp. Why? Because there was a truck that was right behind me. I think it was a FedEx truck going about the same speed as me. And he was actually doing the same thing that I was telling you how I do with other trucks that are just a tad slower. This FedEx, I, could, I saw him gaining on me earlier uh, when we were still in Texas. Um, and it looked like he had the capability of passes me, passing me, but he elected to just stay behind me. And he kept a safe distance. And I was coming up on the off-ramp here, so I signaled well in advance. That way I gave him ample opportunity to... If he's going to stay on the interstate, he can move over to the other lane and not get slowed down by me, who's wanting, to, who's going to slow down before I even get to the off ramp. If I'm in my personal vehicle, I'm not even going to slow down for the off ramp until I'm already on the ramp. But in my truck, different story here. I, I'm not going to do like what Sierra England teaches, like by going uh, like whatever, like the like half whatever the speed is on the advisory speed on the off ramp. That's stupid. Um, but I am going to slow down reasonably so I don't have to overuse my service brakes either. And the, the sooner I give someone behind me advance notice that I'm going to do that, the sooner they have uh, the ability to look at what their options are and possibly move over if they can. Or if they're not paying attention, uh, sooner or later they're going to see my turn signal on and uh, end up slowing down on time. Uh, so... It's a lot of little things like that. Thinking ahead for not just yourself, but also for the other person. Uh, you got to anticipate. They expect that they're going to do uh, things. And just be ready for it. Uh, leave leave space. Uh, you don't need to be right on the ass of the person in front of you. I, I can assure you, not one damn good thing is going to come from riding the ass of somebody. Back it off. You don't need to be right on their ass. And don't worry if some people get into that space in front of you. All right, so what? Just go about your way and don't worry about them. Um, yeah, and use uh, read up on the Smith system as well. That's uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the full detail on that, but that is something that trucking companies do actually uh, 
preach is use the Smith system. Um, read up on that online and uh, you know try to apply that to your driving, whether you're in a truck or a car. You'll be uh, you know you'll have a lot safer experiences from that. All right, uh, how the truck? Uh, next question: How the truck drivers who drive in the city or go in slow moving traffic? Uh, highway traffic avoid losing breaking air pressure okay that's an interesting but good question um, so obviously uh, air our, our our service brakes are, are pressurized by air but now let me first explain we have a red and a, a blue uh, hose back there hooking up to the trailer the red one is what you call the uh, the emergency kind of system where it constantly supplies air pressure to the brake chambers and uh, if you don't have any air pressure in the system at all they spring load by default to the the set position so you have to have a constant supply of air going to the brake chambers to overcome the spring force that's in those chambers to, to release the brakes um, Now the blue one is when, like, when you're using your service brakes, the, you know, you're actually pressing the, the service brakes. You'll actually put air through the blue side to kind of counteract the, and make the brake chambers go the opposite direction, uh, just temporarily. It's kind of a just basically a supply on demand kind of system. Um, now, if, if you're having problems, if even if you're in heavy traffic, yeah, you know, first minimize your use of the brakes. Again, why do you need to be right on the ass of the person in front of you in that kind of traffic? You don't. Now, watch what I do in heavy traffic, any of my LA videos especially. Uh, if you see me in traffic, look at what kind of space I tend to give other people. Um, and I'll even anticipate. Like, you know, same with gear changing. Truckers a lot of times don't want to be shifting gears more than they have to if they're in a manual transmission truck. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, these auto shifts great for city driving. Okay, you know what else is great for city driving? Quit riding the ass of the guy in front of you. And just because they're doing 30 miles an hour doesn't mean you have to. If they get up to 30 miles an hour and then you see traffic in front of them slowing back down to 5, 10 miles an hour, you know they're going to slow down to 5 or 10. Why do you need to do 30? Uh, man, why, make that, why make that extra gear change to get, into that, to get up to that speed knowing that you're going to have to just come right back down to that gear you were just in in the first place? It, it's it, it's just idiocy to me. It's like just keep your relax, keep your gear where it already is, keep your speed constant. Let the traffic flow around you. Let the four wheelers flow around you. They're gonna do it anyway. But so what? Um, yeah, I mean, if, I make it a game actually. Try to get from like, let's just say uh, maybe I'm on the ten freeway. I want to make a game out of it. If I'm in traffic all the way from the fifty seven freeway to the six hundred five freeway. How uh, how few times can I do uh, uh, gear changes or apply the service brakes in that in that span? Yeah, you know, on a normal commute day, like yeah, I can actually count it or something if I really want to, just just for the fun of it, uh, and then try to challenge myself to uh, make it like a personal best. Oh yeah, it took me about 15 uh, gear changes this time around. Let's see if I can do 14 next time or something. Yeah, keep that mentality, and you'll find yourself uh, honestly not needing to shift as often as you. I mean, you're gonna have to shift regardless. Or the truck will do the shifting, of course. But even in an auto shift, uh, they always want to be on the highest gear possible, so you get no engine braking capability. So sooner or later, you're gonna be having to hit that service brake when I won't. Now, when I won't have to. Um, so that's something else there. Uh, you can also manually force it into lower gears and then just, again, just don't be in the highest gear possible or go in the highest speed you can just because you can. Uh, you know, I say just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, that's the best advice I can give on that. Uh, if you have a problem with losing air pressure and, and traffic conditions, I'd say you have a problem with your equipment that you, should, you really shouldn't have your equipment, equipment on the road for in the first place. Uh, you probably have an air pressure leak somewhere or I mean like a, a hose leak or a brake chambers pissing out all your uh, your air or um, a, maybe an airbag is leaking or 
Uh, I don't know, it could even be your glad hand connection. Something along that line going on and your, your air compressor is going to keep running a lot more frequently. Uh, even if you do have a leak, a lot of times your air compressor can still adequately keep the pressure above 100 PSI so that you don't lose pressure, um, you lose brake pressure and your ability to keep moving forward. Uh, but, again, watch that. If you keep hearing air hissing through one of your your yellow or red valves or uh, also when you do your pre-trip, uh, the applied pressure part of the test, uh, the pre-trip, you're supposed to, uh, this is part of every day's pre-trip you're supposed to be doing, is uh, check your, your air compressor kicks on at or above 100 PSI, make sure it kicks back off at or below 130. Uh, and then you also have an applied pressure test, which is engine turned off, both parking, both brakes released. Hold, yeah, put your foot down on the brake pedal. Then uh, hold your foot on the brake pedal, and then uh, look at your your primary and secondary gauges. And after, uh, and then hold it there for about a minute. And it should not lose more than four psi while you're doing that. And after a minute, if it loses more than four psi, you got an out of service condition. You need to get that fixed. Uh, and then also you have the, the lights and buzzers test, of course, when your air pressure gets down to about 60 PSI in that ballpark. Uh, there's a range, but uh, it's around 60 PSI. You'll, uh, you know, your audible warning should come on saying, hey, your pressure's low. And then you also, uh, yeah, the buzzer, whatever. Yeah, the light, the light will also come on, whatever, and you're on your dash. And then when you get down to uh, roughly, you know, maybe 25 to 40 psi, somewhere in that ballpark, your uh, uh, your pop out check it will be complete. You know, your your parking brakes will automatically set once you get down to a certain pressure. All those are things you're supposed to be doing every day uh, on, on every pre trip. Uh, do on a practical level, do any of us really do it that way? No, but uh, I'll I'll peer on it. I'll just, I'll especially do it if I have any inkling that there's a leak on anything, uh, my tractor or the trailer. I can tell if it's uh, if my compressor's running more often than I than it should, or if I'm shut down for my 10-hour break. I pop my brakes. I, I set both my tractor and my trailer brakes, and when I'm done with my 10-hour break, how much pressure is still in my reservoir? If I'm still up above 100 psi, then like, well, it looks like I'm pretty good. Then, yeah, I don't need to have. It's not likely I'm going to have any problems with uh, anything by then. But it's still going to, you know, you should still check all of that stuff regardless. Uh, just because it's uh, fine with no brake pressure applied doesn't mean that you'll be fine with brake pressure applied. Uh, so, uh, all in all, yeah, if you have any problems in traffic with maintaining air pressure, you have a problem where you need to get to a shop ASAP and get it fixed. They don't need to be on the road with your equipment doing that. So I hope that answered that question.